here at CMPD is crime management. And that focus for us is on violent crime. This series was concerning to me. It impacted me greatly. I have daughters. We had a seven-year-old girl that was struck by gunfire and all she was doing was playing in her own neighborhood. The response that we had to this crime and the series of crimes was fast and it was calculated and we brought as many resources as we possibly could to try and impact the situation. We had over 50 officers on the ground, including patrol detectives. We worked this till two or three o'clock in the morning. We had community members that did speak with us, but they were few. Thankfully, we've been able to develop leads in these cases that we are actively working and continue to work today. We received numerous questions from the community members and media partners on the shootings. So I want to provide as much information as I can for you today. First shooting occurred at 4400 Hovis Road at 3.14 p.m. We had an assault with a deadly weapon call. We had two juveniles, teenagers, that were outside of the convenience store. They were targeted by an individual in an automobile, fired at them. Those two individuals ran to a nearby house where they received medical attention. Police officers responded to that scene and worked that scene heavily. I was there. I can tell you that I saw a lot of community members out in their driveways on the street looking. I know that there are people in that community who know what happened and who know who did it. Yet they do not come forward to talk to police, provide us any information to help us. CMPD cannot do this job alone. We've got to have help. That help has to come from the community. Media members who are with us today interviewed members of the community yesterday afternoon, last evening, who were very upset, talked about how members of their own community are impacting the neighborhoods where they live. And even then, we still have very little communication back from our residents, people who work in that community. And I'm really at a loss to explain why. We want to make these neighborhoods safer, not just Freedom Division, not just Thomasboro, the entire city. That work has to happen in conjunction with the people who live and work in Charlotte. The second incident on Marble Street certainly is something that any parent dreads to know that your child is outdoors and the moment that you hear gunfire, you look out and you see your child and that, that individual is, is struck. Uh, it's deeply disturbing to me. We continue to work this case the seven-year-old victim, thankfully, is in stable condition. The two other juveniles that were struck by a gunfire are also in stable condition. Chief Jennings is adamant that we continue to put our resources in those areas where these crimes are occurring. We had significant resources on the ground last night, and that will continue throughout Freedom Division, but especially in those areas, Thomasboro and those, those locations along I-85, where we have seen a series of gun crimes over the last month. The majority of these gun crimes have been shooting in occupied dwellings. And we've talked to you about this before. Shooting in occupied dwellings where individuals either drive by or walk by a residence and fire rounds into a home. Quite honestly, this is done to scare and intimidate, but the people who are shooting aren't thinking about where those bullets go. They don't think about once this bullet leaves the end of this gun, who's on the far end of it? Who's in the house? Who's in the house behind? Who's sitting in the car in the neighbor's driveway? Conflict resolution continues to be an issue in our communities and the inability of people to be able to solve conflicts is something that we have got to work together to resolve. And we're asking for help. We're asking for help from our faith community. We're asking for help from our neighborhood leaders, but specifically anybody who's watching this broadcast, we're asking for help from you. We need your help. We'll continue to work this case. The department's crime gun suppression team, firearms unit, freedom division, and federal partners work through the night and will continue to work on these cases. Uh, those leads that I talked to you about, unfortunately, are something that I can't divulge at this time, but we believe are going to help us in identifying additional suspects in these cases. And I expect that we should be able to charge individuals, uh, hopefully within the near future. 
Overall, globally for the department, there have been 101 gunshot wound cases in our jurisdiction. That's an increase of 9% from this time last year. Proactively, we continue to monitor and use our data. We continue to use the crime analysis group that we have internally here at the police department to identify people that are involved in retaliatory shootings. And we are very intentional about going after those individuals. Um, we also go out and do proactive work in the neighborhood. We had a homicide and freedom division that occurred last month. The division itself will do roll calls in those communities where our officers will actually go out and instead of doing a roll call in the division office, we'll do it right there in the community, right out front of everybody. Uh, that visibility is important because we want you to know that the officers are there to serve you. This isn't about a show of force. This isn't a show of anything other than we want to be involved, engaged in your community. That's really important for us. Um, and, and we encourage you, if you see us out there, come talk to us. Come meet the person who's behind the badge. But the message to anyone who's out there who is involved in this kind of activity is please, please don't do it. Please think before you pull that trigger because the person that you're targeting is more than likely not the person that you're gonna strike. Chief is interested in hosting a community conversation in this area uh, in the near future. Uh, we'll be putting out some details on that, uh, whether that will be a virtual or in-person meeting, but certainly that's something where the Chief is, feels that our investment uh, needs to be communicated beyond just seeing officers on the street. And that communication needs to be happening at every level. So when you see a police officer who's out walking in your neighborhood or on a bike or in a vehicle, we want you to have that conversation, but the chief also wants you to hear that from him as well. So that's gonna conclude my comments. And then do we have any questions from the media? We'll answer those as we get forward. Robin Cannon. Okay, Robin Cannon with Fox. Hey, good morning. Thank you so much for taking my question. This is Robin with Fox 46. Just wondering if you can clarify the connection between the the two shootings, uh, the one where, and, and you said it was teens. Can you also tell us uh, the victims, their ages, the, um, the teenagers in the first shooting? And then do you believe that same vehicle went to the, where the seven-year-old was, uh, was shot? So the question is, how are those two scenes tied together? Uh, Robin, I can't disclose uh, the ages of the other two individuals at this time because we're still working both of these cases. We disclosed the age of the uh, child because we felt that was significant. Um, the fact that we have a seven-year-old, and I'll be quite honest with you, this is not the first time that I've talked to the news media about a seven-year-old being shot. We had a case in North Tryon Division some months ago where we had two groups of people that were shooting at each other and around penetrated an apartment and struck a child in the mouth. Uh, you know, that, that has got to resonate with the public. It has to. Public should not be standing for this kind of activity. The fact that children are getting struck by gunfire, I just don't understand why we don't get the, the public comment and outcry about this kind of activity. It's unacceptable. But to tie the two cases together, what I will tell you is that we can tie them together by geography, and there is also evidence that links those two cases together at this point. Um, because the investigation is ongoing, I don't want to jeopardize any work that the detectives are doing, but we will be able to provide you with information once we get to a completion state with this one. Okay, Lana Harris. Hey, Lana Harris, WCNC Charlotte, thanks. So are you able to say how many bullets were fired and how many times each victim was shot? Okay, so the question is how many uh, rounds were fired and how many times the victims were struck. I'm sorry, I can't provide that information to you. I can't say that quite a few rounds were fired. Um, we had multiple uh, residences. We had at least two buildings that were struck and two vehicles that were struck. Those vehicles were unoccupied, uh, but certainly the, the number of times that people shoot is only limited by their intent. Um, and so when we have two groups of people that see each other, whether they're on foot standing across the street from each other or they're in cars, which oftentimes happens where we have people in cars shoot at each other. Uh, those bullets travel from the, the point of that gun being fired uh, anywhere. And so, you know, we're, we're concerned. CMPD is concerned about public safety in traffic ways, in multifamily housing or single family housing, because oftentimes our, our, our suspects will come in the dead of night and they will approach a house and they'll fire those bullets and may not strike that house. They might strike the next door neighbor's house or a house behind so the, the, the impact is far beyond just that situation. 
So again, we'll be able to release more details. This investigation has really not stopped since last night and will continue until I feel like we have made uh, a, a distinct effort to get people into custody. So next question. Courtney Cole. Courtney Cole. Thank you for taking my question. I know you said earlier about there were some shootings into homes. About how many of those have you all seen this year? So I was referring to what's been occurring in the Freedom Division. And the Freedom Division geographically is bordered by 85 and 485, and it generally extends up Hovis Road towards Brookshire Freeway. Uh, we noted back at the beginning of March we were having a series of shooting and occupied dwellings. So far at our last count, we've, we've noted 14 of those incidents. We have made arrests in some of those cases, and what we are looking to do is to determine how these are tied together, if they're tied together. Um, what we see as a driver is conflict resolution, the lack of the failure of people to be able to resolve conflict in what we would consider to be either a nonviolent way or a non-deadly way. And, and the disappointing thing is that now we see culturally this environment where people resort to guns immediately. As soon as I feel like somebody has insulted me, either in person or through social media, my first instinct and reaction is to go retaliate. And the first thing that happens is the guns come out. So CMPD has to work on a number of things. We have to work on gun control. And that means that people who legally own guns have to be able to secure those firearms the appropriate way so they don't fall into the hands of people who are gonna use them. Second piece of that is to work with community members to identify situations where we have conflicts that are occurring and the community or the family can't stop it. They don't know how to handle it. They need to contact us. We have CIT, we have people who are specially trained to be able to deal with these kinds of situations. And all you have to do is call. All you gotta do is call us and we'll come out and help you with that. So again, conflict resolution is the driver behind this. It may not be a situation where it's a drug deal. It may not be a situation where it's you know a, a robbery. Uh, frequently, it's just because people are mad. And in light of the environment with COVID and everything else, we understand people have been home, people have pent up frustrations, but it cannot be a situation where the next thing you do is pull the trigger on somebody. Next question. Sarah D'Elia. Hi, Sarah D'Elia from WFAE. Thanks for taking our questions this morning. Just wanted to make sure I understand this correctly. It sounds like there's still a lot of need for community to come forward, um, but you mentioned that you're you're hopeful to be making an arrest soon. Can you explain a little bit more about, are there people that have been questioned that you are, is anyone classified as a suspect at this point, or are you still kind of trying to, to weed through that at this point? Sarah, we've identified persons of interest in this case, and the detectives are working those leads. Uh, there was a lot of work that was done last night. Um, generally, in a police investigation, what we want to do is collect as much evidence at the scene as soon as it occurs and talk to witnesses. Um, our hope is that once those witnesses come forward or we are able to identify people that are involved, we have those conversations with them that we generate additional information. But it takes a combination of things for us to be able to charge somebody. We have to have evidence, we have to have probable cause. Uh, there are a lot of 